Hello, I'm Robert Kelly, and this is a Record All Monsters quick look at the Colossus of New York. From time to time, there will be films that, for one reason or another, don't quite fit into our main narrative of the history of giant monster movies. But, like mysterious planets, invisible from our position in the solar system, their influence is still felt on the heavenly bodies we can see. And by heavenly bodies, I of course mean giant monster movies. Now that we've looked at the three giant monster movies directed by Eugene Laurier, there's only one more movie in his filmography as a director. 1958's The Colossus of New York, and we're going to take a quick look at it, just for the sake of completion. As previously discussed, Laurier's directorial output is an outlier to his overall career in film, and with the movie we're examining today, we have the outlier for the outliers. His sole film that is not about a giant dinosaur monster stomping cities. Colossus of New York feels like an extended episode of the Twilight Zone to me. And this may be due in part to the presence of composer Van Cleve, who would go on to compose for around 30 episodes of the fabled anthology series. Interestingly, this score is performed solely on the piano, as orchestras were on strike at the time. The sparse instrumentation combined with footage occasionally sped up to keep the runtime down to the preferred 70 minutes for a B-movie on a double bill, like this was, gives some of the movie's horror sequences a feeling similar to silent films, especially Fritz Lang's Metropolis. And this story deals with many of the same themes about humanity, empathy, love, and progress. This movie centers on the death of a brilliant humanitarian and scientist, Dr. Jeremy Spencer. His father, another scientist, transfers his son's brain into the body of a monstrous Frankenstein-esque robot, hoping to keep Jeremy alive in order to continue his research. But once Jeremy is revived, he has to be convinced by his father to continue living and working, and has become aware that he is slowly losing his humanity. And at the same time, his brother is moving in Spencer's wife with romantic intentions. Of particular note is the Colossus itself, an eight-foot-tall costume that took seven-foot-tall actor and stuntman Ed Wolf 40 minutes to get in and out of. Notably, Wolf had played the robot in the 1949 serial The Phantom Creeps alongside Bela Lugosi. His performance here apparently includes some underwater stunt work which I can't imagine was fun or comfortable, but looks amazing. I say, apparently, because I'm not sure how it was actually achieved. I couldn't find anything on it. Overall, this movie is good, if a little rushed in terms of pacing and a little simple. That puts Eugene Laurier at 4 and 4 in my book, and I recommend all four of his directorial efforts. If I had to rank them, I would say Gorgo is my favorite, followed by The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, and then The Giant Behemoth and this, separated by the thinnest of margins. In the end, I say check this out. It's a lot better than I expected. It's inhuman. Inhuman. It would be inhuman to deprive the world of his genius. With your knowledge of automation, you can help him to live again. Fantastic are the implications of this story today as men delve ever closer to the secrets of eternity. This story of a human mind and emotions encased in a steel colossus without a soul. That isn't just an abstract intellect. It's a brain that remembers and feels and suffers. Do you think for one minute he can continue to exist when he's been deprived of everything he's ever known or loved? 
impelled by an overwhelming lust for revenge against the world that remade him in this inhuman mode. Unchecked by any barrier of man or nature, running wild in a terrifying orgy of destruction. So that was the Colossus of New York. Uh, once again, I highly recommend it. It's not quite fun, but it's a compelling little sci-fi movie. And with that, we wrap up our unit on Eugene Laurier. <laughs> so the Rondo voting is still going on until April 25th. That way you can email Taraco at AOL. Dot com. Vote for Record All Monsters in Best Multimedia Website Category. And uh, vote for Derek M. Cook for Monster Kid of the Year. That's a write-in category. Uh, beyond that, you can use the ballot as a checklist of just all the cool genre stuff that has come out over the past year. Next week, we will be back with uh, a full episode talking about Mothra with Austin Forbear Douglas Ford. Uh, he's a good friend of mine and Courtney's. We're really excited to talk with him about that movie. Week after that, Monster Mailbag. Got a few more questions. We'll take a look at actual questions and not just uh, customer service surveys. And then the week after that, we'll be talking about King Kong versus Godzilla. Not Godzilla versus Kong. We will get... We'll probably do a quick look at it the week after. Just to, um, you know, cover all our bases. We might have some guests on for that one. But for the time being... Um... We're not going to take a full look at that movie until uh, until later, when we get to it. <laughs> and considering that we're still in the early 60s, it's going to be a minute. But, uh, that's it. And that's it for this episode of this mini-sode, this quick look. Uh, Eugene Laurier, great director, all four films... Solid, at least. And, uh... Yeah, keep that in mind, and remember that monsters are your friends. <laughs>